hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we're addressing the various parables of Jesus, which are contained in the Gospels. And this week, the parable of the workers in the vineyard, which is found in the Gospel of Matthew. It's a decent-sized parable with a number of different messages and separate elements to it, so let's check it out. The kingdom of heaven is like to a householder who went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard, and having agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Matthew 20, 1 to 2. Today, when pennies are worth so little that it's barely even worth stopping when you find one on the street, this sounds like an insane agreement. But the word penny here is an attempt to translate a word referring to a denarius, a standard Roman silver coin worth about a day's wages. In short, this agreement makes sense and would probably be the sort of agreement that a vineyard owner might form with out-of-work people in those days. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing in the marketplace idle. And he said to them, Go you also into my vineyard, and I will give you what shall be just. Matthew 20, 3-4 the ancient Jewish means of telling time was a little different from the means we use today. The third hour, which is referred to here, means about nine in the morning. It was the time for incense and certain sacrifices to be offered, and the temple gates opened. When the vineyard owner hires these men, a couple hours after the start of the workday, he doesn't specifically say what he'll be paying them, only that it will be just. And they went their way, and again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour, and did in like manner. Matthew 25. The sixth hour again would be about noon. The vineyard owner goes out to hire more people when the workday is already half over. But about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing, and he saith to them, Why stand you here all the day idle? They say to him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith to them, Go you also into my vineyard. Matthew twenty six to 7 we use the term eleventh hour to mean the last possible moment when it might make any difference, but to the Jews, this was about five in the evening, meaning the workday was almost over. In fact, depending on the time of year, it might be very close to dusk by this point. Yet he goes to the trouble of hiring people for this tiny portion of a day, perhaps only a period of an hour of daylight in which to work. And when evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith to his steward, Call the laborers, and pay them their hire, beginning from the last even to the first. When therefore they were come, that came about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. Matthew twenty eight to 9 The one-hour workers are being given what the vineyard owner said was the rate of pay for a full day's wages. This is uncommonly generous of him, since they didn't have the chance to do that much work. But when the first also came, they thought that they should receive more. And they also received every man a penny. Matthew 20, 10. Many of us are used to the idea of hourly wages, and even back then there was definitely a sense that people should be paid in proportion to the work they've done. However, instead, each was paid the amount they'd agreed upon before the job began. And receiving it, they murmured against the master of the house, saying, These last have worked but one hour, and thou hast made them equal to us, that have borne the burden of the day and the heats. Matthew twenty eleven to 12 The first people he hired had worked for a longer time and suffered more than the more recent arrivals, and they were upset that they weren't getting a better rate of pay, despite the fact that this was the rate they'd already agreed on. In the context of the parable, this means that the amount a person works or suffers matters much less to God than their decision to turn to him and agree to do his will, no matter when they make that decision. In any case, the amount that an individual person suffers largely depends on the circumstances of their life, so it's not always their decision or to their credit, even when it does happen. But he, answering, said to one of them, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Dost thou not agree with me for a penny? Take what is thine and go thy way. I will also give to this last, even as to thee. Or is it not lawful for me to do what I will? Is thy eye evil because I am good? Matthew 20, 13-15 They made an agreement, and the vineyard owner is honoring that agreement. Just because he's paying by the day rather than the hour doesn't mean he's done something objectionable, nor would it even be wrong of him to hand money out to people who hadn't done any work at all. 
It might be unwise, but that's another topic. There's no rule that says you can't be charitable so long as you're being charitable with things that aren't owned by someone else. In the same way, if God gives great blessings to a person who's only worked for him for a short period of his life, he's not being unjust. It's up to God how he distributes his gifts. Remember, Moses himself was already an old man before God called him to free the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. How many people can claim to have received greater blessings than Moses? Was that wrong? Should God not have called Moses because of how old he was? Of course it's not wrong. Some people will make their choice to follow God through a lot of horrible suffering, and others will suffer while serving God for only a short time before their death. God shows mercy on all of them because they made the right choice, but that doesn't mean he owes some of them more than others. So shall the last be first, and the first last, for many are called, but few chosen. Matthew 2.16 Those who convert and pledge themselves to God later on will reap the benefits of having done so, while a person who endures a hard life for God from the cradle onward will probably suffer more, but won't necessarily be given a superior fate. Both chose to work for God and both will be rewarded, but the degree of the reward doesn't depend on the amount of time spent gaining it or the amount that a person has suffered. It may seem confusing that this is the case, but remember, it's not our hardships or endurance that earns us eternal life. Only the mercy of God can give us that. The mercy of God is not increased by the fact that we suffered more than someone else. I also think the final sentence is interesting, since it draws a distinction between the called and the chosen. Who is doing the calling and who is doing the choosing? The calling, it seems, is being done by God, who doesn't want any to perish. 2 Peter 3 9. In Catholicism, we refer to this call as actual grace, a grace which God gives to people freely to allow them to do good things. However, not everyone responds to actual grace. Sometimes, will have the grace needed to make a good choice and simply decide not to. That's why, at first, I thought chosen meant people who have chosen to respond to the call. That would mean that it's the people themselves who do the choosing. However, while the people do choose, God also has free will, and he chooses to grant eternal life to those who remain in a state of grace or seek forgiveness and confession after having sinned. So, in a certain sense, both the people and God choose. Next, the wineskins. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.